Hello everyone and welcome to another casual review. I finally finished Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. This one has been in my backlog for a long time now and I've been putting it off just because of how long I've heard that it takes to complete it and I actually did put in a good 40 hours into this game so it is quite a the ask. Normally I don't like longer games like this but I just love the uh, Studio Ghibli aesthetic and um, I was really curious about it. I really was went into it not knowing too much about it. I, I have a lot of good things to say about this game, but I also have quite a lot of gripes, so let's just get into it. First of all, I just want to talk about this game's appearance because that is the main appeal to me. It very much looks like a Studio Ghibli film turned into 3D. Now, I'm not sure exactly how much involvement Studio Ghibli had in this game or if they just did the cutscenes and uh, most of the uh, 3D assets were made by level 5 games, but there are a couple actual 2D cutscenes in this game, and I was actually really spoiled because like most traditional RPGs, I really like the beginning of these types of games and the ends because that's where like all the cool cutscenes are, that's where all the voice acted parts are, and this game is no different because I feel like the beginning just has all these awesome Studio Ghibli cutscenes and, and everything's voice acted so we can, I guess it's so we can get an idea of what all the characters sound like, and for the majority of, like, the middle of the game, it's just reading text, like the text bubbles, and at least we know what each of the characters sounds like, but I, you really get spoiled at the beginning with this game, and then of course when you get to near the end of the game, near the climax like that's when all the uh, cutscenes happen all the voices come back into play and it, it it just like ramps up from there speaking of the voice acting i absolutely love the voice acting for all of the characters they were all so charming i think that's one of the game's strong points is each of the characters is super likable you really like the main character oliver he's like this 12 year old boy but he's just super polite and super kind-hearted i wasn't like that at all when i was a 12 13 year old boy but he's just so nice and just he believes in everything that is good and he always says jeepers and it's just super charming and his story is actually kind of sad because um our our main character how the story starts out is his mom dies and so he finds out that there is a parallel world of sorts similar to ours and there are soulmates that are that share like a bond to who we are in this world and so he figures hey uh, his mom has a soulmate in the other world and uh, if he goes into this other world and helps out the her his mom's soulmate, perhaps there's a way that he can bring his mom back. So immediately, we just feel for Oliver, and we just really want his uh, quest to be successful. So how does he find out about this other world, you ask? Well, it's as it would turn out that his doll actually ends up being the king of the fairies or something like that he's this he's this uh little charming character with this lantern hanging from his nose he's got this super heavy welsh accent that i absolutely love and i really wish that i could hear him talk a lot more just because i love that welsh accent he always says things like tidy and and man but it's all it's spelled like m-u-n i don't it, i i can't do a welsh accent so i'm not really going to try but just trust me that it is just a treat always hearing mr drippy talk that's the name of the fairy his name is mr drippy so anyways mr drippy tells oliver about this other world and um the story progresses from there we meet a couple of other characters lots of fun kings throughout all the the cities this is a very fantastical world full of monsters and magic it is just a delight Speaking of the monsters, these mon the monsters in this world are called familiars, and that's how m the majority of the combat happens is you can obtain these familiars and you can use them in combat. You can also just play as Oliver, and Oliver plays more like a wizard. As you play through the game, as you progress, you unlock more and more spells, so many spells. Every time you do like a main boss, they just give you like five spells and so if you want to play like a wizard you can just play as Oliver the whole time I guess but that doesn't really work because you're going to run out of MP and so how you do your basic auto attacks that kind of combat is you obtain these familiars and I guess I am going to be associating these familiars like Pokemon because I feel like that's the best way to describe what's going on here and it is the most understandable to people who haven't played this game so you obtain these familiars through a system that I absolutely hated 
So um, instead of throwing like a Pokeball at these familiars that you encounter throughout the world, and th the world, it, it, it isn't random encounters, which I'm very much appreciative of, but when you're traveling, it does that whole like overhead view camera where your characters like are not to scale at all and they're super big and you uh, collide with the enemy and that's what starts the encounter, similar to the newer Pokemon games. And every time you defeat a familiar, there's basically like a very, very slim chance that you'll like, I don't know, earn his respect or whatever. And then you can serenade this familiar to become your own. And I really came to hate this because it's just such a small chance of this happening. And there are certain side quests where the quest requires that you obtain the like three certain familiars. And for some reason, like uh, I spent a good two or three hours just trying to get this one particular familiar and it just would not trigger that serenade thing and so I just slaughtered tons and tons of familiars trying to trigger this and it just wasn't happening and it is a very frustrating capture mechanic. I think um, I think my favorite way of obtaining monsters in games like this would probably be Digimon Cyber Sleuth and it basically every time you encounter an enemy then it fills up like this little bar and once it reach 100% then you just get the egg of the enemy. I think I really really prefer that way there's like no chance it's just it still can feel a little grindy but at least you know you're definitely making progress towards obtaining that monster rather than it all being left up to chance um, my second preferred way would probably be the pokeball system this way just is so not great like and it, it just adds to the grindiness that this game already has so you have these familiars and you are leveling them up and then eventually you can evolve them Oh, sorry, then eventually you can metamorph them. So you give them this item, you feed them like a crystal that is associated to their sign. And signs, uh, how this game kind of works is like a rock, paper, scissor kind of system. So like sun signs are good against moon signs, moon signs good against star signs, star signs good against sun signs. And so you give the, the familiar who has a star sign, you give him like a star sphere and he metamorphs. The uh, one thing that they do with this game is when they metamorph, their level count resets back to zero. And I know they did this in Digimon, but at least Digimon had a daycare center where they could level up when you are not using them. And also when you're playing on the Switch, they would also level up when your Switch was asleep. This system does not do that. So it really kind of stinks when you metamorph a familiar, especially in the later game, you're going to have to grind quite a bit to get them up to par to where they should be to fight the rest of the uh, enemies. I feel like in that aspect, it might be best just to pick your familiars from the very beginning and just stick with them. I feel like the game would be a lot easier if you did this and would reduce a lot of grinding. It, it kind of stinks though, because um, near the beginning of the game, most of the familiars designs are really not good, not good and uh, the the familiar designs don't get a lot cooler until way later in the game or unless you metamorph them and you grind to get them up to the level where you can metamorph them to a cooler stage I, I really just not really sure how I feel about the whole design of all the familiars they feel like you know in a like a Pokemon evolution line, the starter Pokemon, like let's say, let's say the Bulbasaur. I feel like all the familiars, even when you metamorph them, look like Bulbasaurs. And when you have, like, when you metamorph them, they really don't change shape that much. It basically like gives them a cape or now they have chest hair and they really don't change that much. They, they actually do change a little more significantly in their third stage and you can choose between two stages like uh, two forms in their third stage, depending on uh, how you want your familiar to be. I'm really diving into this system of metamorph, but I'll, I'll just leave it right there. I, I just don't like the design of any of them really. And I feel like the metamorphing should make them feel and look cooler. So the combat kind of reminds me of what I remember from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It's been a while since I played this game, but you can move around. It's not like a traditional turn-based mechanic. Basically, it's like you have commands from your familiar. So you, you can move around, but when you t 
until you're familiar to attack an enemy, you're basically locked into doing basic attacks for like five seconds. You can always cancel out of this prompt, but I just wish you could move around while you're basic attacking because there are certain bosses where you have to move away from the ground because like a, a giant eruption is going to uh, flow from this circle. So you got to move out of the circle, but in, you always have to like cancel out of your auto attacks in order to move your character. That was kind of a nuisance, but I guess you do kind of get used to it near the end game. Like, okay, there's an enemy. You got to get out of your attacking. This game also does require you to use the block command a lot and I'm usually not used to doing this usually I'm just like I'll just tough out the uh, enemy attack but some of the bosses they you'll see them like start charging up and you really do have to get out of your attack command go into your defense command hold the de defense to uh, weather the storm that's about to come otherwise the uh, attacks are actually pretty significantly strong even for like basic familiars not even the bosses sometimes their attacks can do quite a lot of damage and you know I actually saw like when I was reading about this game online a lot of people were claiming that this game is pretty easy and I'm afraid I'll have to disagree. There were uh, quite a few times when I'd come across a boss and he was giving me trouble. I would actually get a lot of game overs and you just have to go back and grind. I actually did all of the side quests, all of the bounty hunts. Bounty hunts are basically like, hey, go kill this mini boss somewhere in this world. And so when you do these side quests, you get certain boons like, oh, this will increase your XP you gain and things like that. So I did all that. And even then I felt like I still had to go back and just grind and kill random enemies in the overworld and then go back to the main boss and then I was able to finally do it. But I don't, I'm not really getting where people are coming from that this game was easy. I felt like I, it gave me a, some trouble actually even the like especially the final boss the final boss took me a long time to beat maybe i'm just bad at this kind of game maybe i'm just dumb i don't know the bosses themselves i feel like the designs are really really cool and very memorable i remember pretty much every single boss but they all have these special moves that i was talking about earlier where you really have to go into your defense command in order to block them and these bosses will do these super powerful moves multiple times throughout a battle like say five times and you just basically have to sit through this whole animation thing before you can move again it's basically like you have to watch this little like 10 second animation and at you know it doesn't sound that annoying but when you have when you're in the midst of a boss battle and you have to just have to watch the same animation over and over again it can get a little tedious it's cool the first time they do their move like oh wow that looks like a, a really powerful move oh man how am i gonna stand up against this but then you watch it over and over again the same cutscene it just gets kind of annoying after a while even like your own character's moves it does the same thing over and over again. You have to watch your own familiars do their special moves. If you want to use them, you just have to watch the same animation again and again. I ended up with a couple familiars that I did like. I did keep the familiar that you start out with at the very beginning. He's, I guess he's, his, uh, class is a might. I ended up naming him Gunther because it kind of reminded me of the penguin from Adventure Time. And it turns out that one of your party members has a familiar also named Gunther. So they, they totally stole my name. Anyway, so uh, I guess I should go more into the party system itself. You have Oliver who can have up to three familiars that you can switch between. You have another character. She's like a girl. She's kind of like a spell caster. And so, you know, I immediately made her a healer. And you can set the tactics so they they aren't that specific. The AI on your team is actually kind of dumb. They don't use the defense command when a bo boss is doing like their big bad move. Um, you just kind of have to deal with it. But I made this girl character. She's kind of like my spell caster. She's my healer. And then you also get another character and uh, I just gotta have him do uh, melee damage, guys. You actually do get a fourth character pretty late in the game, which is weird that they would give you a fourth character so late into the game, but you can only have up to three characters, so you have to switch one of them out. Um, I'm kind of rambling, but each of these characters can have up to three familiars. So really, 
you're controlling 12 different characters. You can play between these 12 different characters. They all have their own stats. They all have their own equipment. They all have their own abilities. It can be a little much. So really, I just focus on Oliver when I want to use my damaging spells or do quick heals to help out my, my uh, girl character who's supposed to be my healer. And then when I wanted to really get in there and do damage attacks, I had this cool... Like, uh, he, I really like his uh, fast, quick attacks. He's like this devil-looking guy with a pitchfork. I called him Impy because when whenever you get a uh, familiar, they give you, like, suggestions for their names, and you can just scroll between the suggestions. I really wasn't planning on using this uh, familiar, but he ended up being my favorite. And I, I wasn't sure if there was a way to change your familiar's name because I really don't like the name Impy. I think it's really uh, uh, not well thought out just kind of like a throwaway nickname but he ended up being my best familiar in the game just because his damage output was so high during his like main basic attacks obviously when you're looking at this game the main appeal is how it looks very cell shaded i think they did a wonderful job transferring the studio ghibli aesthetic into a 3d world very like cell shaded kind of reminds me of uh, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker love the music it's like this bombastic orchestra it makes you really feel like you're you're going on a quest you're trying to save your mom you're trying to save this parallel world like there's so much adventure out there so much out there to discover and you really feel that when you're looking around especially when you're like the overworld and you can just pan the camera around you when you're in the cities the cities feel so large and lived in even though they are actually pretty enclosed so like you're not going to get lost or anything like that but it just all the cities feel like real cities it's it's awesome it's just a really fun game a really fun world to be in as you play through the game, you are given a book, and it is called The Wizard's Companion. This is where you uh, get all your spells, you get pages for The Wizard's Companion, but they also have a lot of other stuff, like detailed pictures and descriptions of the bosses that you previously fought, of all the familiars. There's, like, stories, kind of like... You know, like in Harry Potter, the beetle and the bear, like just stories like that, like folklore, like fables about this world. And I will absolutely never read through the Wizard's Companion, like all the stuff that I don't need to read through. But it's fun knowing it's there. I would really love some sort of physical Wizard's Companion. Then I'd probably look through it, but not in the game. The side quests themselves just kind of feel like busy work, even the bounty hunts themselves, like eventually you start seeing repeats of these mini bosses, just different color palettes. The the side quests, they're just kind of like, okay, so there's a system where Oliver, he has a spell called Take Heart, and uh, it's not as nefarious as it sounds. Basically, um, the, the main bad guy, Shadar, he made the denizens of this world brokenhearted, and that means that they're missing certain traits that just make a good heart, I guess. So there's traits like love and empathy and ambition and curiosity. Like I'm not sure if curiosity is one, but you get just like good traits to have, and you'll come across these side like characters, these side quests where oh, I don't want to run my business anymore. What's the point? And you'll, oh, this character is brokenhearted. He needs ambition. And so as you play through the game, you'll come across other characters who are not brokenhearted that are just full of ambition. Like, oh man, I can't wait to go out there and, and uh, uh, make the world great. And so you take a little bit of their ambition. Apparently it doesn't hurt or anything like that. Apparently it gives them a, a warm feeling. It, it's fine, all is dandy. So you take this other character's ambition and then you go back to the brokenhearted guy and give them the ambition. And okay, now I'm ready to start up my store again. What was I thinking? And it, it's, it's a nice sentimental thought, like giving, uh, healing all these brokenhearted people, giving them all these good heart traits, but it is just very uh, tedious. Like you, you get a ton of these side quests and they don't really add anything to the story. It just feels like busy work. And I guess that's kind of where my main gripe of this game is, is the busy work, all these meaningless side quests and all this grinding. And I, I really do feel like that stuff is necessary to 
do as you play along. I don't think you can really skip a lot of that, or you're going to have a really tough time fighting some of these bosses. I like in this world, there's there's human characters in this world, but there's also like characters that kind of are, are like uh, animals. I'm, what's the word? When they're like, uh, um, I'm thinking of like Bojack Horseman, like... Uh, uh, where they're like half human half animals so like you'll come across the uh, weapon shop and he'll be like a crow and he's got all these uh, bird uh, puns he'll be like it never hurts to be too cautious or you'll come across like this cat king and his name is your meow just the just fun little puns like that um, that they just slip in through the dialogue as you're playing I really enjoyed that so when I'm looking back at my playthrough, I just finished the game maybe like not even 10 minutes ago, and I'm looking back at the game, and if I was just looking at this quick condensed PowerPoint of my adventure, my journey, I'd be like, yeah, that is an awesome game. I had a lot of fun. Look at all these different locations I visited. Look at all these different adventures I had, all these relationships that I built up. It was really quite the adventure, but when you are in the thick of it, when you're you're in the middle of this game, it, it kind of just has the RPG things that I really don't like, like the traditional filler stuff that I was complaining about. It, it just feels kind of meaningless. And really that the highlights are peppered in throughout. I really wish that if this was like a condensed game with all the highlights and it was maybe like a 15 hour, a 20 hour game, it would just be a wonderful experience. Um, the in-game clock said that I clocked in around 40 hours and I think that sounds about right. I, um, I really was feeling a little bit burnt out near the end especially because they they kind of wrap up oliver's uh growth story and then there's like a whole other like story point that needs to be wrapped up after that i won't go into much more detail than that but it, it's kind of similar to the last of us part two if you ever played that where you think it's the end of the game but then it's like no you still have like a good five hours left you gotta you gotta play through all this stuff and so by the end i'm just like oh, okay come on let's just finish this up like i said i did finish all of the side quests and bounty hunts Except they do add a lot more in the post game after you beat the main boss. Like, hey, if you want to play a little bit more, go ahead. Um, by that point, I had already rolled the credits and I just like, nah, you know, I'm good. That was that was a good enough experience. I think overall, I it, it was a really, really good game. I really had fun with it and I would definitely recommend it if you like these this kind of like RPG uh, tropeness. It's it's not turn-based, but it has a lot of those tropes like managing equipment and abilities, leveling up, grinding, that kind of stuff. I think I will give this game a 4 out of 5, but it is a I, it is a high four out of five. I was very close to giving it a five out of five. If it, if it just had cut out all that extra filler, it would have been a total five out of five. Well, guys, that's it for me. Let me know what you think about Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. I'd love to hear from you guys. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. Bye.